Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Generally, I wouldn't actually be giving a lecture just about filoviruses, and that wasn't even really the case until a couple of years ago. But then, of course, a few things happened in West Africa, so we'll be talking a little bit more about that as uh, time goes by today. Um, but first, and this really does bear a repetition here, um, having to do with paramyxo and rhabdoviruses, because molecularly I like to think about the filoviruses as just being big, long, skinny um, paramyxo or rhabdoviruses. In terms of their molecular replication patterns, they're extremely similar with just a couple of little exceptions to them. Um, so quick review here, which would be, you know, mononegavirales, okay, so single negative strand is what's making these particular virions. <clears throat> Their structures are actually pretty variable, and that also lends credence to the whole idea of the filoviruses. How they get in turns out to be very similar as well. We've got a glycoprotein on the outside that may or may not be directly connected to a fusion protein, depending on if you're a paramyx or a rhabdovirus. Replication is really dependent on what, whether you have replication or mRNA production, presence of the nucleocapsid protein. Um, so again, replication is going to be dependent on that, either make your messenger RNA or not. This all happens in the context of N binding to the genome. Translation is actually pretty boring. Once those messenger RNAs are made, you make protein, but you make a lot more of the end protein because you have more of that messenger RNA due to this start-stop mechanism. So you make the first messenger RNA, that will be released. In some cases, the polymerase will release. In some cases, it will keep going. And so that means that everything that's coded at the three prime end of the genome, you make a lot more of. Everything that's coded down at the five prime end of the genome, you make a lot less of. What's way down at that five prime end? Which protein? Big, massive open reading frame. The L protein, which also does what? The RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So while we're reviewing for the midterm next week, right? Good. Uh, and then how you get out is through budding that happens at the plasma membrane, and these fusion proteins can lead to syncytia, so the fusion of a bunch of cells. Yeah? Yeah, so most animal viruses don't kill off the individual cell when they're being produced. I would say that's true for most of the budding viruses. Um, we'll talk about after the midterm, again, you know, who thinks about that now, uh, some of the more naked viruses that are not enveloped, and some of those do actually seem to burst and kill the individual cell that they're infecting. So it's not you know, completely, as always, there's always exceptions, it's biology after all. Okay, more questions on paramyxos and rhabdos. And when he says that, what does he mean? Time to get out your clickers. Exactly. So, uh, again, this is great review for our um, <clears throat> phyloviruses. Concentration of which of the following measles virus proteins is most important to determine whether mRNA is made or genomic RNA? Or for that matter, anti-genomic RNA? There's still a few of you who haven't registered your clickers. If you look on D2L and you see no clicker points next to your name and you've been here and clicking away, let me know. There are three or four of you who have lots of points that aren't associated with their names yet. So please let me know who you are. 
Otherwise, I will try and find you, but I make no guarantees. So um, what does the L protein do? It's the polymerase and also involved in capping. What does the G protein do? It's the glycoprotein. It's the one that's on the outside that's interacting with these um, other, <coughs> other proteins. So C and V, what do they do? We didn't talk about them, so I wouldn't worry too much about them, except for the fact they're encoding these funky different reading frames in the same part of the genome. So what does that leave us with? N, exactly, um, which is the nucleocapsid protein <laughs> binding to the genome, and that determines what's going on with replication. So <clears throat> big pictures. They're basically you know, these mononega virales, so who cares? Um, this, of course, hemorrhagic fever is why people care um, about them. So um, again, key concepts, a couple of different things. Um, I like to think of these as sort of you know, ginormous rhabdoviruses, but they do have also what people call RNA editing. I actually really like to think of this as kind of stuttering, uh, but you know, in terms of coding genes, and we kind of saw this when we talked about the paramyxone rhabdoviruses with the PCV um, overlapping open reading frames. One thing that is quite different with these viruses is the transcriptional regulation. So there's an extra level of transcriptional regulation above and beyond the presence absence of the N protein. It has to do with the VP30 protein, and then of course this, this whole you know, fever thing. Uh, until a few years ago, no one would recognize what this was. Now you can get plushies of this um, from giant microbes. So this is the classic <coughs> Ebola virus virion. I'm going to switch things around a little bit from my normal order and talk about the disease and things at the end. And those of you who printed out the notes know that there are way too many slides, so we're not going to get through all of them at the end. So I want to talk about the important stuff at the beginning, um, i.e., structured genome proteins, editing, and regulation which, again, is really similar to these, these rhabdoviruses. Uh, difference here is that we have this VP30 protein, but otherwise extremely similar. Glycoprotein on the outside, matrix protein, no, I don't expect you to remember VP40, VP24. I would expect you to remember L, but L is really easy because it's just the same as the rhabdos and paramyxos. Um, NP instead of N, 99% of the time when you see N, it's going to be the same as NP, or NP is going to be the same as N. And then we talk about some of the other viruses as we move on through the class here. Um, they'll all be Ns and NPs. They're associated directly with your nucleic acid. And again, the big difference here is this VP30 protein that's also associated with the nucleic acid, which is here. One thing that is somewhat different between the phyloviruses and these paramyxos and rhabdoviruses, the virions are really big, and the genomes are really big. Um, in fact, these are the largest mononego virales genomes. They're up to about 20 kilobases in length. So they're really very, very long, um, just slightly shorter than some of the coronaviruses. This, for reference down here, is our Sendai virus, classic paramyxovirus genome. This one is Ebola Zaire, which actually has been renamed Ebola virus. They keep changing the names on these things, which is really annoying. Uh, but basically, as far as we're concerned, we're really only going to talk about this one in any kind of detail. Uh, has, just like the case for the paramyxos and rhabdos, this short three prime sequence at the beginning that the L protein binds to and is bound to in the virion when it releases that genome. Because remember, these are all negative strand RNA viruses. They have to have the polymerase associated with them. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. So they then <coughs> encode this NP protein. Again, extremely analogous to the N protein. Again, it's the concentration of this protein that determines whether you have genome replication or messenger RNA replication. The differences are actually having to do with some of these other genes. These now overlap with each other. So the stop codon 
for this messenger RNA and also where the RNA polymerase is going to stop and release the RNA actually overlaps with this next gene. And so these are actually very slightly overlapping. They're not massively overlapping like we have in PCB down here. These guys are just ever so slightly overlapping in this region. The same thing is true for VP35 and VP40 and VP24 and VPL. So slightly different because here we had this gap between ends and starts, and now they overlap with each other. They all are capped, all these messenger RNAs. That capping activity also seems to come from the L protein, very similar to what's happening down here with our <coughs> excuse me, paramyxo and rhabdoviruses. The <clears throat> main proteins here, this is the table from the textbook. Again, NP, just, you know, helical nucleic capsid protein. The important ones are really here, and I would say much more the VP30 rather than the VP24, and the glycoprotein. Um, GP, glycoprotein, anytime you see glycoprotein, again, looking at any of these viruses, that's what's going to be in the envelope, sticking on the outside, that's what's going to be normally interacting with receptors, escaping from the immune system, et cetera. Um, this is type 1 transmembrane protein. That means it's got one transmembrane helix. Also is important for fusion. So again, this should sound extremely familiar, not just from paramyxo and rhabdos, but coronaviruses. And when we talk about flu on Friday, which actually is a way scarier virus than Ebola, which is scary that no, not most people think about that. Um, <clears throat> but again, extremely similar in terms of interactions between the receptor and the causing of the fusion that takes place. Again, nice, nice, maybe not the right term, but a highly hydrophobic alpha helix which is involved in sticking into the host membrane and then conformational changes that bring these two together. Um, there's also this bizarre secreted glycoprotein, which not quite clear why this is. Some people say it has to do with confusing the immune system. So, and we'll see how you make this secreted glycoprotein in, in just a minute here. Uh, but then the other one is this VP30 protein. This is not present in any of the paramyxo and rhabdoviruses and does seem to be important for this extra transcriptional regulation step that we'll talk about in just a minute. But first wanted to talk about the glycoprotein. Again, this is probably starting to sound like a broken record, but that's good because this is pretty common in lots of different viruses. This is made as one single protein, so this would be the N-terminus here and the C-terminus that will be directly attached here to the rest of your protein. Again, single transmembrane helix. This gets cleaved. The cleavage here takes place through a cellular protease. So this is not using a viral protease, it's using a cellular protease, which may or may not be required for function. Depends on which research paper you read about that. Again, highly glycosylated, that's why it's called the GP protein. Um, it gets processed in the endoplasmic reticulum in Golgi, which is exactly where all the other normal membrane glycoproteins that you find on cells are being processed. So in that process through the endoplasmic reticulum of the Golgi, that's where you get all the glycosylation. That's where these cleavage events um, are often taking place. Uh, just like we've seen before, trimers, fusion peptide, which is right here. Again, very hydrophobic alpha helix. Once you have binding to the receptor by this part of the protein, this gets out of the way then this fusion peptide is available to do this membrane fusion process. Uh, for a long time, we didn't know what the receptor was on the cell for these glycoproteins, but because of this outbreak, there was a huge expansion in doing Ebola virus research. And so <clears throat> January of last year, um, this was a well, sort of the main figure in a paper in cell where people just took this piece of the glycoprotein from Ebola virus and found that it bound to a particular part of this protein called neiman pick c one that nobody really cared about because it was mutated in this very rare genetic disease. And then, of course, we find out that it's important for Ebola virus infection. 
And it turns out it's a particular piece of that protein, one of these multi-transmembrane, probably important for transport purposes, but you know, the real role of it is not particularly well understood. But it does seem that there's some very specific interactions between this protein and the glycoprotein. So we've got a pretty good I idea how these things are binding to cells. Presumably, after you have this interaction, this would now, the dotted line here, that's all the rest of the glycoprotein. This would cause a conformational change. This gets out of the way, and these two membranes would fuse with each other. That process is not very well understood at this point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Transcription replication assembly, hmm, should seem really familiar now. A lot like paramyxone rhabdoviruses, got the same sort of start-stop process, same sort of stuttering for putting on poly A tails, same amount of GP, let's say it's not GP, NP protein in terms of genome and antigenome and making messenger RNA or not making messenger RNA, and the budding happens at the plasma membrane through this GP40 protein. Actually, not unlike what happens with the PCV open reading frame in Sendai viruses and most of these paramyxoviruses. There's also use or multiple use of reading frames in, and it seems to be just one of the genes in these phylovirus genomes and particularly in the Ebola virus genome. This is how you get your secreted glycoprotein versus your non-secreted glycoprotein. It's a stretch of nucleotides that are all the same. In this case, it's all poly A. And then the polymerase probably getting confused again, just like it does stuttering at the end to make sure you have a nice long poly A tail. Here, instead of having your you know, seven A's in a row, it makes eight. Just by adding an extra A residue, the template has seven U's. Here you end up with eight U's, or actually eight A's, because it slips and, and makes the wrong copy. Interestingly enough, this editing is absolutely required to make the glycoprotein. So unlike the PCV proteins that we were talking about last time, where C and V seem to be you know, somewhat important for virus function, here, if you don't make the glycoprotein, you're not going to make a functional virus. So this editing is absolutely required for function. What people have done is they've gone in and made some changes here in recombinant, actually complete Ebola viruses. That's, those are harder experiments to do because of the biocontainment facilities. And we'll talk about how some of those are done a little bit later on. Um, you can actually make an Ebola virus that has a different sequence here in terms of the nucleotides, but gives you exactly the same amino acids. And this virus here doesn't produce a secreted glycoprotein. It only produces the glycoprotein. And that seems to function quite well, at least in the cell culture, the controlled conditions. On the other hand, if you make it, you change these A's here so it can't get slippage, the virus is uninfectious. So editing here is absolutely critical for getting virus function. And the other thing which is different on a molecular level is this transcriptional regulation. This is a figure from the textbook. The first couple of times I read this, I went, what the heck are you talking about? You know, this is your messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA is blocking transcription? But that looks like it's blocking translation. So I went back, I checked, and I checked again, and I pulled up some of the original literature. Uh, so what I think would be a much better way to show this is not the messenger RNA for the nucleoprotein, but the genome right here, which codes for the nucleoprotein. Because that also is going to have a stem loop structure right at the beginning of this RNA. And that stem loop structure in the genome is going to block the transcription of this messenger RNA. That makes sense? Yeah, because if you have a stem loop structure here, the complementary strands, of course, are going to be able to bind to each other just as well. So this should really be, I think, a much better way of looking at this would be looking at the genomic RNA rather than here, the messenger RNA. But it is 
well known, and people have looked at this, is the VP30 protein will apparently get rid of this hairpin. Exactly how that works is not entirely clear, but in the presence of VP30, you get the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase making this messenger RNA. In the absence of VP30, you don't make this messenger RNA. And again, you can make one of these fake Ebola viruses in the lab lacking VP30. It doesn't ever make the end protein. If you don't make the end protein, you're never going to make genome. You're never going to be able to replicate. So that makes sense? Yes, no? More questions before I ask you a quicker question? Sure. The N protein, N or NP protein, where is that in the genome? Very much at the beginning. So if you stop the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase from making that first messenger RNA, are you making the rest of them? No, because it's always staying on and continuing to make more messenger RNA. OK, so this should hopefully be pretty straightforward. Which of the following Ebola virus proteins appears to interact with the cellular receptor? GPL, NP, VP30, or VP24? What I should do is wait till I get 100% here and just stop it. <laughs> Except for those people who haven't voted yet. So. Are there more than 48 people here? <laughs> more than 48 clickers? Yep, 49. Good. Bring your friends clickers. Use them all. <laughs> 10. So what is the probable cellular receptor? Uh-oh, that wasn't one of the answers, was it? Neiman picked C1, so this the protein that they solved the structure of. So um, L protein, again, does what? RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. NP binds to the genome. VP30 changes transcription because of this hairpin structure. VP24. You said don't remember VP24, so I didn't bother. <laughs> and what does that leave us with? GP, exactly. So uh, now I want to spend some time talking a little bit more about the disease aspects and so on and so forth. And one of those really important aspects in terms of understanding how Ebola virus works um, is this so-called recombinant system here, which is how to make a really nasty virus from defined components. And this is actually really kind of hard to do if you think about the fact, again, that this is a negative strand RNA virus. So it's got to have your genome, you've got to have the polymerase, all of these things in order to actually make an infectious virus particle. And so the way that this is done is diagrammed over here. You have the complementary DNA for the virus genome. You have a very convenient bacteriophage T7 promoter, which we talked about before. That's the specific <laughs> promoter that only works with the T7 DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Also is really fast, et cetera. So this, you can make the genome with that. That whole genome is made. You also encode a ribozyme in that RNA. Um, the ribozyme is an RNA sequence which actually has enzymatic activity. And in this case, it's a endonucleolytic activity. So it will chop the end of your genome to give you an exactly right length genome. So now you've got your genome. 
This is not terribly useful unless you have all of these other proteins which are being made to make an actual infectious virus. And those proteins are, of course, the L protein, because you have to have the polymerase, but you also have to have all of the proteins that are binding to your genome. So you have NP, you need VP30 because it's going to allow you to get transcription to take place. And it turns out you also need VP35. So you actually have to have six plasmids in this cell in order to make your infectious particle. Well, where do you do these kinds of experiments? In my lab at Portland State, yeah. I'll infect all the undergraduates with the Ebola virus. They probably wouldn't appreciate that very much. So um, all of this work has to be done at uh, BSL-4 level, biosafety level 4. Uh, this, believe it or not, um, is one of the biosafety level 4 labs in the US. Anyone know where this is? This is not at Portland State, no. We do not have any BSL-4 labs. Actually, none really even on the West Coast. Um, this is in Galveston, Texas. And all of these wonderful windows here on the outside um, don't lead to anything. It's just a pretty facade on the inside. You'll notice also this um, right here in the middle. That's where the actual BSL-4 lab is. This is the entryway right here, um, considerably worse than getting into an airport um, going through here. It's also, you'll notice up on this second and third floor, what's one of the problems with Galveston? It floods and what else happens? Hurricanes <laughs> happen. So I had a really interesting conversation once with some of the people who designed this lab. And they basically talked about how you design a high security biosafety lab where you have hurricanes. And one of the things is to make sure it's off the ground, <laughs> which is one really important thing. Um, and then, uh, basically, these, all these BSL-4 labs are BSL-4 labs. So it's a lab. It's a building inside a building. So it's a BSL-3 building. And inside that BSL-3 building is a BSL-4 lab. Um, and they did have a hurricane soon after this happened. Um, Katrina was a little off, but... What was the other one that hit Galveston? I can't remember off the top of my head. But they saw it coming, because you actually can see hurricanes as long as we keep our satellites flying. Different story there that we won't get into. Um, but you see the hurricane coming. You shut down the lab. So all the high pathogenic stuff goes into their special sealed containers. They were back up and running at BSL-4 a week after the hurricane. Absolutely no problem. Everything's still at the highest biosafety level. And talking to these guys, is like, well, why put this right in the way of a hurricane? Well, at least you can see the hurricane coming. You can't see an earthquake coming. So there may be some method to that, that particular madness. Plus, this, um, why have it in Galveston, Texas? Any ideas? Less regulation. Less regulation in Texas. No. <laughs> That would be interesting, no. Um, the, one of the main places that tropical diseases are studied is at the UT Medical Branch, which is in Galveston. Um, partly because it was a big port and that's where a lot of these diseases came in from. That sort of squiggly line picture of the Ebola virus virion was actually taken in this building. Um, and you may wonder, you know, how do you get an infectious Ebola virus particle and take pictures of it? Well, first you inactivate it, but then you also have an electron microscope that's at a biosafety level 3. And in fact, I think this is the only electron microscope that I know of at BSL-3, which is actually in this building, um, to take those pictures. So, um, seeing these virus particles, um, you can do these kinds of experiments at BSL-4, but you can also look at the samples which are actually there. So what are these samples? Um, interestingly enough, the first one of these phyloviruses to be discovered was discovered in Marburg, Germany. OK, well, what this is, these are tropical diseases. What the heck are they doing um, in Marburg? So Marburg is this really pretty university town. It's actually the castle in Marburg um, in the middle of Germany. Uh, they have a very strong microbiology department there. And they had a couple of people who were working on some, in fact, cell culture from monkey cells. And a couple of people died of this in the 1960s. 
Um, they had about 50 cases of this, and then also eventually found through a poor veterinarian in Belgrade and his wife, who also both died of one of these filovirus diseases, um, that it was coming from the monkeys. So the monkeys that they were working on had been infected by these diseases, and that was um, where it was spreading from. Before 2005, nobody really cared about these diseases, um, but they were all present basically where there were direct contacts between wild animals, mostly monkeys, but um, probably there's a reservoir species which is not the monkeys. The monkeys actually do get rather sick, um, and maybe why they got caught and then brought to Marburg was that they were sick. Um, so and these were very limited outbreaks um, in very underdeveloped Africa, and we'll take a look at some of these pictures a little bit later on. All of this is in Central Africa, particularly centered around Uganda, Sudan, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, but these were all very limited numbers of outbreaks. Then there was an outbreak in Reston, Virginia. What kind of phylovirus outbreak would you have in Reston, Virginia? Well, Reston, Virginia is quite close to Washington, D.C., and even closer to Bethesda. What's in Bethesda? The NIH, um, CDC's in Atlanta. But um, the monkey facility for the NIH is in Reston. And so it was in their monkey colony. They had a number of monkeys die of nasty hemorrhagic fever. And we're going, oh, what the heck is going on here? And eventually they found that there was a phylovirus, um, very closely related to Ebola, which was infecting and, and killing off these monkeys. Fortunately, apparently no interaction with humans, and that's, we figured out that actually probably has to do with the sequence of the receptor protein. Remember, Neiman pick C1? So Neiman pick C1 in monkeys is different enough from Neiman pick C1 in us larger monkeys uh, that you don't have any kind of infection. So it actually turns to be a really nice model system for trying to understand how Ebola is working um, in those particular cases. So why the heck do we care? Well, um, again, kind of like the case with SARS, MERS, et cetera. Um, high fatality rates. Uh, and we'll get back and talk a little bit more about these high fatality rates. These are high fatality rates in these very underdeveloped or developing countries. And we'll see a little bit later on why, why I mean that. Um, hemorrhagic fever, um, you basically bleed out of everywhere, which is really kind of nasty. Uh, and it seems to be mostly through the activity, in fact, overactivation of macrophages. Said the first couple of cases, even in Marburg, were from working with monkeys. The ones in Reston, Virginia are monkeys. But again, these monkeys get sick. So there must be presumably some reservoir. And if you look at bats, it turns out that bats very often have Ebola-like viruses that are circulating with them. How can you get Ebola virus, any of these filovirus diseases? Very close contact, it turns out, is, is really required for getting this kind of disease. And unfortunately, that ends up being a lot of medical personnel. And as we'll see, uh, many of the people who ended up dying in particularly this most recent outbreak actually were medical professionals. Uh, highly immune suppressive, so if you are infected with one of these filovirus diseases, you're very susceptible to infection by other diseases as well. And so probably a lot of the fatality that happens is not just because of the hemorrhagic fever, but it's because of secondary infections that take place as well. And at least until very recently, and even now, um, I think a lot of this has to do with the media. Because you know, until 2013, there were 3,000 total cases of viral virus disease ever that people had reported. So 3,000, that's pretty minimal. How many do we have for measles? Yearly? in the world, about 500,000. So we need to bear this in mind. But what's the fatality rate for measles? 
one in a thousand, one to five hundred, about one in a thousand. So one in a thousand versus one in three or one in two, that's why people get concerned about this. But the absolute numbers are really very small. Yeah? Yeah, so it um, turns out that there are some pretty clear differences between Marburg and particularly the Marburg genome and the Ebola virus genome. So there were some Marburg outbreaks and there were some Ebola virus outbreaks. So for instance here, um, this is a Marburg outbreak, here's a Marburg outbreak, here's a Marburg um, outbreak. But that's Marburg and monkeys or humans? These are all human cases. Oh, all human. These are all human cases here. Um, and highly sporadic. So. 80 to, 80 to 87, 2000, 2001. Um, these are, in effect, actually, this is two separate Marburg cases here in 80 and 87. Um, very small numbers here. And that, I'm sorry, and the rest was only monkeys? Rest in is only monkeys, yes. So the outbreak was only within monkeys? Yeah, and those are only within monkeys. Okay. So, again, I know a few of you listen to TWIV. Um, they come up with these punny names, so no restin for the weary, um, talking about various different Ebola virus disease. And um, yeah, 67 was again in Marburg when they discovered the first file of virus disease, um, 2,800 or 40 infections, and 1,940 deaths. So a yeah, pretty high rate, um, but only about 50 of these individual outbreaks that people had known of. Um, and if you look at the actual virion, it's actually pretty wimpy. Um, if you heat it up too much, do a little detergent, a little bit of light, um, the virions fall apart pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but what that means is it's actually kind of hard to sample and get these viable viruses unless there's really, really large numbers of them. But despite that, um, Dustin Hoffman gets to dress up in his suit here um, and run around the world and you know, try and protect everyone from it. So, um, yeah, so, but this was well before that. Um, so, and well, in fact, I forgot to bring my image, and we'll talk about, in fact, how we dealt with that um, a little bit later on. So, I started lecturing on Ebola in 2012. And I said, hmm, okay, there's really you know, not much going on here. You know, we had one in 2011 that was fatal, seven in 2012, about half of which are fatal, um, 24 um, here in Uganda, again, a separate outbreak, about half fatal. In Congo, again, about half fatal. Um, for Marburg, similar kind of thing, um, 15 confirmed, eight probable, 15 deaths. One tourist died, uh-oh, peek, a whole tourist has died. In fact, this was someone who visited one of those bat caves. Hmm, yeah, I'm not sure enough, but, and then they had a US tourist who came down with Marburg but ended up surviving. So I gave this lecture for a couple of years, and then in 2014, and this was literally my lecture on the 2nd of May in 2014, um, there was a new Ebola outbreak. And there we have 200 some cases in Liberia and Guinea, um, 146 deaths in that case, and pretty standard fatality rate for this kind of disease. One of the nasty things was that a lot of these were healthcare workers, um, and so people who had, had actually direct contact with the patients, um, and this was the kind of protective equipment that they were using at the time, which is, we now know, is really not quite exactly right. So um, 14th of April, um, this is where the outbreak was. Um, actually relatively contained. Um, all here in this region right here between Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. But one of the big surprises was, compared to that Central Africa map that we looked at before, all these are countries over here, and now we're having this outbreak of disease over here. And so for a while, people didn't know what it was. And that was one of the, the big surprises and potentially why people didn't get onto it really quickly. Yeah. 
Um, so where these are the hospitals that are reporting. In fact, these are the only hospitals in that area. And to give you a bit of an idea what that looks like, sorry, back up here. Um, this is the central market in Kisidugu. So this is the kind of environment we're talking about. Uh, this very open uh, dirt streets, um, et cetera. And this is the main market in the whole province of, of Kisidugu. So it gives you kind of an idea what we're looking at here. Um, retrospect, um, probably the first cases came from this place um, here, Kaliandu in Guinea, December of 2013. I'll turn down the lights a little bit. Um, the only way to get into and out of this town is this tiny little road here, motorcycles and foot is basically the only traffic that is moving around here. And despite the fact that we have all of these borders around here, these are very flexible. And so this is, in fact, um, Kisidugu is right here. And here's Sierra Leone. Here's Liberia. So people moving back and forth here all the time. That was Kisidugu, the marketplace I showed you is up here. And that's the major place. And Makenta is one of those hospitals. Um, there's also a hospital, which is right there, asking your question about where those hospitals were. Um, and that's where they started to have reports of these diseases. And everybody said, you remember all these other outbreaks? At most, a couple of hundred people. So they thought, and eh, it's probably not that bad. Um, this was looking in Guinea, starting out December. This is actually that case in, in Kisidugu, in the Kisidugu province. Started to go up and then came down again in April. Everybody figured that you know, it was over. At this, at this point, you know, you self, know, self limiting, limiting, don't have, don't have a big issue, issue with it. Of course, we of course now, now, no, no. no. Um, um, yes, we, yes, we did mess, did up. mess up. Uh, uh, because, because of a number, number, of number of different reasons, reasons which are, which are outlined, outlined in this really, really nice, nice um, New York Times article, article where, where you can go and take a look and basically, basically the local, local health authorities, authorities completely fell, fell down on the job, the WHO, a really, really long time working health organization to decide that things were going wrong and this happened. Everything got completely out of control. Again, this again, is started, this is started right here, right here um, at, um, the at the beginning, very beginning, and then, and then spread, spread throughout, throughout Guinea, Guinea um, um, the Sierra, Sierra, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, and Liberia. And the main, and the main problems, problems here, here are these big cities, cities, cities um, um, here, here on the on coasts, coasts, which is which where, is where the, the disease, disease ended, ended up coming, coming from. Uh, um, this, this little area, area right here. Right here Pretty low, pretty low population, population density, density probably would have been relatively, relatively, relatively limiting, limiting, but then, and then ended up ended spreading, up spreading out, out through the rest through of the rest of the country. As it got into cities, 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 ended up ended up being a really really major problem. problem. What what the way, the way that we ended, we up, ended up taking care of care of disease, disease had to do, had to do with, with mostly, mostly much better better protective equipment. equipment. So so um, here here is. Treatment facility. These were um, Médecins Sans Frontières. Actually, unlike the WHO and most of the local governments, said this is a real problem, but nobody listened to them. Um, and so they set up these clinics where you had full protective gear. Not you saw the person in the lab, you know, with the gloves and and uh, hairnet. Um, here, this full protective gear and other people putting on your protective gear and also taking it off. Um, that was one of the major problems was the gloves then which are contacting the patients. And one of the big problems that we had with Ebola, which we found out mostly through this outbreak, is that also the dead who've just died of Ebola disease have very high viremia. So they've got very large quantities of virus. So even though the Virion itself is pretty wimpy. If you're really close to and having lots of contact, some of those will get in. And it seems that actually a relatively small number of virions can actually end up causing disease. Uh, 
Um, so it's really this um, PPE which is the major reason that we're able to move forward as far as this is concerned. So what happened? Remember, it was on the order of 3,000 cases worldwide before 2013. Now, um, and this is data from the CDC in 2015, it's gone up slightly since then. We're now at 28,000. So the numbers have gone up again about tenfold in terms of the actual numbers here. Um, and 11,000 people um, ended up dying from this. The very latest, I went to the CDC website last night. Um, they stopped reporting things in April 2016, so they haven't had any more cases. Um, most of these um, were not actually, interestingly enough, in Guinea, which is where the virus arose originally, but in Sierra Leone, and most of that is because things went to the capital. And also Sierra Leone was a lot slower in terms of getting all of the public health procedures in line to be able to deal with the disease. Um, Liberia had a very large number, um, but that actually slowed down considerably. Sierra Leone had um, over the longest period of time. And so that was, you know, again, you know, 10,000 people dying is, is pretty nasty. And we'll talk about some of the other implications for that in just a second. Yeah? That's a really high case mortality rate. It is a very high case mortality rate. Yes, 74% is an extremely high case mortality rate. Now, one thing to bear in mind, and we'll get to this in just a second, um, this is in places where the medical infrastructure is weak to or was weak to start with and still is actually rather weak. And then you have all of these medical professionals dying. So the actual medical treatment there was really not probably where it could have been. And we'll see some statistics in just a second here. Yeah? But with doctors uh, without borders all over, not just the French original group that was implementing the stuff. Oh, so yeah, doctors without borders, it's, um, it's international. So it's, it's really all over the place. So I'm not sure I quite understand your question. Oh, Médecins Sans Frontières. That's just, they go by MSF, um, also Doctors Without Borders, but, you know, DWB doesn't sound as good as MSF. So, <laughs> and originally, they, they, it's a French group. So they, they, they founded it, but it's now completely multinational. Um, in fact, one of the charities that I give to on a very regular basis, they're awesome. Um, so, yeah, kind of getting back to your question about this um, fatality rate. Um, Ebola in the U.S., Fatality rate in the U.S. was what? 25%. And that was probably because this one death due to an imported case, it was a fellow from West Africa um, who came in to the hospital, was misdiagnosed and sent home, um, and then came back to the hospital with really fulminant disease. The, um, he ended up dying. But the other cases, there's one other, which is a doctor who came back from West Africa after working, I'm not sure it was Médecins Sans Frontières or with um, the CDC. Uh, but um, he came back and self-diagnosed and said, hey, you know, I've got the disease, um, take care of me. Um, the other cases, and in fact, this is one of them, were two healthcare workers who actually worked with um, this, this poor fellow here um, who ended up dying and then got transferred from Texas, which is where this happened, um, to Emory. Now, four cases, one person dies. Yeah? Um, is it critical to catch it really early? Um, is it because it was hard to diagnose it? Yeah, so the, the, the question here is basically what to do treatment-wise. Um, and if you have only a few cases like this, and so you know this this person survived, the other all of the other people survived. Um, fluids um, seems to be really important um, in terms of keeping track of them, and really intensive monitoring um, seems to be very important in terms of actually doing treatment. So if you have a fully functional system, the mortality rates are really low. 
But if you don't have a fully functional medical system, the mortality rates have a tendency to be really high. But despite this, this is what really scares me, is there was a survey um, done in 2014. Americans concerned they or their family will contract Ebola. 51 million people. How many cases? Now, at that point, there was zero. Ended up being two later. Um, and my personal care physician, uh, family medicine, said that she was absolutely appalled that people were coming into the office asking for Ebola vaccine. And she said what she should have done was say, here, have the flu vaccine instead, or just told them it was an Ebola vaccine, because it's much more likely to have done something for them. Um, so this is getting back to this whole you know, question of the statistics here. So outside of those three countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia, there were other cases which happened, um, but very, very small, you know, 36 here. Most of those in Nigeria and Mali, which unfortunately also don't have the same kind of advanced healthcare um, as we have here. All these other cases, Senegal, Spain, the United States, the UK, and Italy, um, only one death in the US, and again, that was due to someone who was misdiagnosed when they first came in. So very, very, very small numbers. Uh, well, well, we'll talk about Americans concerned about flu a little later on. Basically the same deal. So, okay, so we're all scared of Ebola now because we live in the U.S.? No, we're scared about the clicker question he's about to ask us. Okay, <laughs> these are easy. Um, in which country were the most Ebola deaths ever reported? Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, USA, or Zaire? D, we want D, we want D. In terms of pathogenesis, or just um, thinking about why flu is much worse than? Okay. Well, we'll talk about flu on Friday. So uh, there are a couple that that I could recommend. So yeah, just bug me, I'll let you know. Five. Okay. Most people are thinking Liberia. Let's go back a couple of slides and see what we have here. Laboratory confirmed cases, total deaths. Liberia. 4810. So you have your notes. Um, it was interesting <clears throat> that uh, now this is uh, probably a bit of an open question and exactly how these um, are <clears throat> sorry, I should move that I move that over. Um, how they're being reported, um, whether these are really necessarily Ebola related or not. Um, a lot of the statistics here are a little open to, to question. But it's interesting that the Liberia rate ended up being considerably higher than the Sierra Leone rate in terms of, of death. And that's probably because Liberia was you know, one of the later ones. Um, and again, Guinea, that's where it originated in this last outbreak, but is uh, not, <clears throat> not where we had the most cases. Yeah. Ah, so I guess the, the question is, are, if you've had Ebola and recovered, are you now immune from the disease? And the answer is yes. 
And so a lot of the healthcare workers that came, were sick and survived went back and then were working in many of these places um, because they were then um, resistant to being super infected or infected again. Um, now they were very sick. There's also a big stigma in that part of the world on people who had Ebola and recovered. And there's some issues with the, well, again, public health system really there and social systems as far as that's concerned. Yeah. High mutation rate in the in the actual Ebola virus genome. So that's one of the things that I wasn't really planning on talking about too much. But due to the fact that now we have really wonderful, very rapid sequencing technology, the genomes. I think there's something like two or three thousand different genomes now of Ebola virus from these clinical isolates. It's insane actual number of sequences which are there. Uh, the mutation rate seems to be about what you would see in a pretty typical paramyxo or rhabdoviruses. Uh, but there are some mutations that may or may not have had to do with disease. And some of those involved in actually that GP protein interacting with the neiman pick c one protein. Um, there's a lot of kind of speculation on exactly what's going on with some of those things. There was a paper that came out, I think, about a month or two ago, where there was a couple of different mutations that seemed to have spread really rapidly among these clinical isolates. So maybe that had something to do with helping that spread. Now, we don't know, but those are some of the things. But there we have huge amounts of sequence data now. In fact, probably more on Ebola virus than um, the vast majority of any of the other ones. So let's see, what else did I want to um, talk about here? So um, this is something that we had posted in the biology office. I don't know if I, you, any of you saw this. Um, so how do you know that you have Ebola? Um, you've got you know, fever, headache, fatigue, diarrhea, vomiting. I've got fatigue all the time. I must have Ebola. Um, stomach pain, um, unexplained breathing and bruising, muscle pain. Um, these are unfortunately, the same kind of symptoms that you'll get with malaria, with a lot of the other diseases which are present and endemic in that particular part of the world. So the diagnosis is actually relatively difficult because if you just look at some of these symptoms, you know, they're not necessary. And in fact, the, the bleeding symptom, pardon me, um, is not a a credibly common one. You don't always get these, the bleeding or bruising. And so most of these other things, you know, really could be lots of other possibilities. Um, top 10 things you need to know about Ebola. Um, basically, if you think you have Ebola, you don't. You probably have the flu. So think flu, not Ebola. Um, I'll just leave this in your notes. There are a couple other things that I want to talk more about in terms of with treatment. We talked about vaccines already, and we talked about RVSV, ZBOV. Um, that does seem to work actually very, very well. Whether it works post-exposure is not entirely clear. Um, these are nasty GMOs that we're using now for vaccines. Oh no, GMOs. Um, will RNAi work is not entirely clear. The main vaccine trial was this mod well, STRIVE some acronym or another, I can't remember exactly what it is, uh, started in April 2015. So this is the combination stage two, stage three um, clinical trials that were happening there. Um, so because it was an outbreak condition, um, you let people know that they really have a vaccine. So yes, there's placebo as well as that, but it's people want to take this or they don't want to take it. Uh, because you can't really, when you have this big disease outbreak that's got a 75% mortality rate, you don't want to say, oh, take this placebo and you know, see if it actually works for you. Um, so <clears throat> that was an, it was um, RVSV uh, ZBOV, which had the G protein. There's also one which has this um, GP30 protein, the one which is involved in the transcriptional regulation as well. And this paper actually only came out in December of 2016. 
So it also gives you a bit of an idea how long it takes to go between actually doing these trials and collecting the data and showing them. And this did, in fact, show that you have uh, really good protection, you now 70 to 100% protection of people who had these ring vaccinations. You had a case and then vaccinate all the people who have contacts with that person and then see how many of those come down with disease. So it worked out um, really exceedingly well. There are some other ideas out there. Um, a Delta VP30, so get rid of that VP30 gene. Again, that's the one that's critical for transcription. You don't transcribe the end protein. You're not going to transcribe the rest of the genome. Um, this is not as developed, hasn't been tested as much. Um, it does work really well in non-human primates. And then there's some discussion of, of this particular paper as well. Finishing up, talking about how much this ended up costing. Uh, most of the money, thanks to us, um, came from the US. Um, $3.6 billion in terms of trying to treat this disease. If we hadn't ignored it after about six months that it was coming out, that probably would have been a tenth of this. Um, massive economic loss to those countries. <clears throat> and a lot of that had to do with the almost 1,000 healthcare workers who ended up dying um, from this disease. Mostly, I'm sorry, I'm 500 here. Mostly very early on before they had all the proper PPE, et cetera. Um, and, but that, of course, has completely decimated the healthcare system in parts of the world that are really desperately needing healthcare systems um, as well. I like this particular graphic here, um, just this relative sizes here, number of cases and deaths reported to all of the other ones beforehand. So that was Ebola before 2014 outbreak. This is the one with that 2014 outbreak. And how do you get Ebola? Um, probably bats which then infect other animals, which then lead to infections of the humans, and then transmission among all of these humans. Um, how do you know about the bats? You do this job that I would never want to do, um, which is dissecting all of these bats and trying to find phyloviruses in these particular locations. And in fact, they did find some bats with phyloviruses very near to Melidungu, which is where the original case um, apparently came from. Yeah? Did any of those people catch influenza? So none of these, none of the people who've been screening here have come down with disease. And in fact, some of these are actually people who've had already recovered from the disease, who've now volunteered to come back and do some of these studies. So we'll stop here. Um, got a, I can maybe show at the beginning of lecture next time what a BSL-4 lab actually looks like. Got some footage of that, too.